holding on to this lead in the very rapidly growing market will prove to be a challenge. It's just hard to take an initial leadership position, have a market go from 25 billion to somewhere between six and eight times that in the course of 12 years and not face the challenges of meeting that growth. But Booz Allen's baseline projection is that India will be expected to meet this challenge. And in fact, Booz Allen believes that not only will India meet this challenge, India will be able to grow share even as the market grows. There's very much a sort of demand pull, supply push, in the long run, supply creating its own demand phenomenon underlying all of this. And it's that interaction effect that, to our mind, most favors India. It's not just the fundamentals of India in itself in isolation. It's the interaction between India developing its capabilities and the developed countries pulling Indian-based engineering offshoring advantages into their critical strategies. <clears throat> Some of the reasons for that are, in fact, simply in the structure of the suppliers. Among low-cost countries, India has the largest and fastest growing pool of engineers. We expect India and China to meet the world's requirements for engineers. This chart needs just one pause, but if you look to the extreme right-hand bar, look at the gray, which is China, and look at the Indian flag, and see that those bars represent our calculation of the additions to the world's engineering capacity between 2004 and 2010. Companies are drawn to India by the quality of its talent as much as for low cost. If you look at the right-hand bar in this chart, which is India, you can see 23% of the reasons people go to India are for the qualified engineers, which is, in fact, a greater proportion than people who go to China, which is first and foremost driven by proximity to markets, or people go to Russia, which is in part to harvest the residuum of the years of communist investment in science and technology. Uh, I won't dwell on this, but in order to establish the back background for what we're going to do next, we have a methodology for evaluating country competitiveness. It's basically two steps. In the first steps, it ap applies three screens successively based on macroeconomics infrastructure, including legal infrastructure, and labor economics qualifications and workforce to sort 190 countries down to 15. And then we've taken those 15 and we've tried to understand, first at a country level, later on at a specific uh, company level, uh, their capabilities in engineering per se, their capabilities in general engineering, and their capabilities in domain-specific applications at both the system and process level. When you do that, uh, that methodology ranks India above China, but it's clearly close. Uh, this is not India in a slam-dunk fashion. If you look at the macroeconomic factors, this is a chart uh, which takes just a moment because it's indexed to liberalization. So the China years are indexed to 1979, the India years are indexed to 1991. But relative to each of those indexes, that is, the years since those liberalizations, you can see India tracking China in GDP growth, in GDP per capita growth, and in foreign direct investment. The result of all of that is that we foresee a market growth for India that comes in waves. We foresee India going from about 3 billion today to potentially 30 or, 30 or 35 billion by 2020. And we see that advancing in waves starting with high tech and telecom, which is the wave we're in today, in part because it is closest in discipline to software itself moving into automotive and aerospace where there is domain-specific expertise but where there is large scale in order to build that expertise and eventually into industrials and utilities which we think will come last because the domain expertise requires some degree of uh, scale to make it incremental. With that as a backdrop, I now want to talk about uh, who, how India is going to compete in the future of this market. India has a large and emerging base of capable service providers. To us, this is the beginning. It's the sort of Silicon Valley effect. You need a critical mass. You need a critical mass to have the phenomenon of increasing returns to scale and at the same time an environment of entrepreneurialism and dynamism and drive. 
And we have assessed the capabilities of these competitors in India, these suppliers, and it, our sense is the critical mass has formed and is in the process of forming. The best of these suppliers are rapidly becoming world class. The blue is at inception. The yellow is inception plus three years. The rankings are against clients in-house engineering, local contractors, co-located engineers, and then India, measuring, in this particular instance, the metric of first-time right designs. And what you should observe clearly is just how fast India caught up to the rest of the world. As we have for countries, for individual companies, we have a methodology for evaluating vendor competitiveness. It deals initially with general capabilities, which I'll speak of first, everything from overall client references and success as clients measure it, down to disaster recovery. And then it'll deal with very specific domain capabilities in both a product slash systems level and at a process level. If you look overall, what you'll see is that today the Indian vendors uh, are behind our four reference benchmark global best practice engineering services providers. But if you look at individual metrics as on the right, the quality of service delivery, you can see that leading Indian companies are today running with the pack. When we want to get down to the level of assessing specific expertise, we build this sort of two-dimensional picture where the farther towards the upper right you are, the better off you are. The vertical dimension is domain and industry specific product process system level applications and the horizontal axis is process level capability that is specific to the domain or the industry. Today Indian vendors rank behind leading western benchmark competitors by a certain degree as you get to the product specific capabilities. But we have been bold. We know a lot about this market, a lot about the structure of many of the players within it. And we've made a projection of how they will advance their industry and domain specific application capabilities between now and 2012. So you can see the reds are where they are today. The blues are where we project some of them going uh, in both uh, by between now and 2012. And the size of the circle is the approximate size of the revenues in the space. When you make that projection, you can see that our future expectation is that leading Indian vendors will, in fact, be able to run with and equal the class of the, bench, the global benchmark engineering services companies. To these players, this is not new news. They are already building on these strengths and expanding to compete with the best engineering houses in the world. So while the origination and the base of this is very much Indian, and while the original founding value proposition is very much low cost, even today we're at the cusp at $3 billion looking to 25, we're at the cusp of a global expansion that is far more broadly based, and that is far less Indian-centric per se. This will clearly open up new vistas of opportunities. Today, Indian vendors get the overwhelming share of their business from North American vendors, from North American clients. Whereas today, in terms of total engineering spend, Japan and Europe are over 50% of the pie. That globalization that we talked about on the previous slide will help Indian customers tap into these markets.